Hi, this is Neil Shook. You're about to listen to episode 100 of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. Now, whilst 100 shows is uh, obviously a milestone, I did really want to try and keep this as much business as usual as possible. Although with the fact that I've got Rich and Mike back on the show, and the fact that we actually recorded this on New Year's Eve, there is a certain amount of uh, frivolity and uh, a slight lack of decorum. And you know, we actually had a good time recording this show, uh, and I wanted to kind of reflect that in what you hear. I wanted also to apologise for the fact that you're hearing this in the middle of January as opposed to just after New Year. Unfortunately, uh, life got very hectic very quickly coming into the new year, um, much more so than I originally anticipated. And so uh, my time um, editing this particular show has been cut down somewhat. But I finally got it sorted, and I hope you enjoy the show. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies, Coat Arms Paints, and Wargame Soldiers and Strategy magazine as well as the generous donations of you, the listener. Many thanks to everyone for your continued support. The Meeples and Miniatures Podcast, Episode 100. The Top 5 Miniature War Games that will be played in 2012. With Rich Jones and Mike Hobbs. Welcome to what is episode 100 of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast, and I'm joined once again by Mike Hobbs and Rich Jones. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. And the first thing to say to everyone is uh, a very happy new year. Uh, we're actually recording this on New Year's Eve, so uh, it hasn't quite happened for us yet, but by the time you're listening to this, we will now be in 2013, so happy new year to everybody. What we thought we'd do today is just do a review of the miniature gaming that we've done in 2012. So this isn't going to be necessarily just new releases in, uh, that have come out this year, but actually looking back at what we've been gaming over the last 12 months and picking out our f- favourite games and chatting about uh, what we like about things, uh, maybe some issues, and just kind of having a general chit-chat. We'll go from there, really. So first off, before we get into our uh, respective top fives, we thought we'd have a chat about some of the stuff that didn't quite make the top five. Now, there's a couple that myself and Mike have talked about, uh, have uh, jotted down and agree on, which is, well, first off, it's uh, Dux Britanniarum from uh, Two Fat Lardies. Uh, Mike, do you want to kick off on this? Yeah, sure. This would have made my top five. If I wasn't so heavily involved in Saga, then this would be the game that would drag me into sort of Dark Age, Romano-British-style gaming. <clears throat> I think the Lardies did a great job on it. It's a really nice campaign system with a game sort of attached to it, mm. which I'm sure Rich Clark won't mind me saying. The the book is wonderful, it's be- it looks beautiful, it reads really well, and I just I think it was a real step up in quality for the Lardies. It would have made my top five, but I haven't had a chance to play it. And that's the only reason it's not there. Well, to be honest, that's, that's exactly the same reason why it's not in my top five. I simply haven't had a chance to play it. The one thing it does really well. It's funnily enough the one thing that Saga is currently lacking, which is uh, a campaign system. I know there are obviously plans in the pipeline for, uh, to do with this with Saga, but certainly the whole way that Dux is, is held together with this overarching campaign system and then slotting the scenarios in, it's done really well. And as you say, it, it really is a step up in quality. Got some fantastic artwork in there. 
it does look to be uh, a fantastic game if only I got a chance to actually play it more than uh, well well at all really so it's it's certainly on my very high up on my to play list in 2013 I've just got to get through and paint all the figures <laughs> yeah same here yeah. well I've got, I've got no figures to play it's just getting time yeah yeah as I say it's, it's, it's very up on my list certainly yeah unfortunately it didn't quite make the top 5 this year if you've heard the interview with Rich Clark we'll be looking at uh, an expansion for Ducks in the, uh, well s- sometime in 2013 with uh, the Irish and the Picts and um, something else which immediately escapes me but it looks like it's going to be a good year for Ducks Britannia Armum and I'm certainly looking forward to getting into it I think looking back at 2012 certain years have had a particular feel to it wasn't it I mean like, like 2011 seemed to be the year of the ancients 2010 seemed to be Napoleonics uh, I think if anything 2012 was probably Dark Age you think I mean especially with the yeah the expansions with Saga as well and also Dux Ballorum coming out and yeah I guess so I mean it, it's difficult for me to comment because I've been sort of blinkered in Saga world when I wasn't playing Saga then I have been playing a lot more different types of games but uh, actually a lot more sci- uh, sci-fi types of games mm. which, I, uh, which I haven't done for a long time so I don't know if it's, it was an odd year there were some really good games out in 2012 and, and obviously 2011 it's just trying to catch up with them which has always been the hard problem that's it as always it seems that the war gamers number one enemy is actually just the time to do everything yeah mm. so uh, hmm Okay, so um, that kind of covers my honourable, honourable mentions of stuff that actually doesn't appear in the li- in our top five at all. Uh, now, Mike, I know you've got a couple of others you wanted to have a quick chat about. Yeah, I mean, first up, there's a Victory Decision, which is a World War Two skirmish game. Mm. Picked it up in 2011. I really like it. I, I like the look of it. It's got me interested in doing skirmishing in World War Two. You know, it's the fact that I can just do, you know, 20 figures, maybe a small vehicle. That'll do me for a game. If, if I want to do anything bigger than that, I'll I'll do 15 mil or 20 mil. But it just looks nice. It looks nice mechanics in there. Mm. You get the rules um, on pins on, pins on demand. When they arrived, they were lovely. So again, this would have been my top five. But again, I haven't had a chance to play it. But it's one I really want to get in and play next year. Yeah. I mean, I know Rich, you've played a lot of this, haven't you? In the past. Yeah, it's good. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you will enjoy it. I mean, it's. One well, of my favourite World War Two platoon knee level games. It's good. Yeah, it seems to. I mean, just just reading through it, it just yeah, it, it sort of grabbed me. I thought you know, there's nothing in there which is wild and you know strange. It just just looked like a, a nice a nice game, you know, a nice well thought out game. So yeah, again, it, yeah, it's sort of the game end of the game, this sort of thing. So mm. it's good. Mm. So it was that one, and then my final one. I almost ran was uh, Judge Dread oh, right, um, okay. from uh, Mongoose. This has been out for a while. Um, it, it's a free download. I picked it up to have a little read through it, and again, I just thought this is a, a nice gang style game, similar sort of scale to Songs of Blades and Heroes. You know, you, you need a half a dozen figures aside. The only downside is the fact you have to build Mega City One to play in. <laughs> um, and then they came out with the Kickstarter, and suddenly I was, I was uh, putting myself massively into debt to uh, keep up with that. Yeah, uh, yeah, you suddenly yeah. found yourself knee deep in Judge Dredd figures, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I um, yeah, I had a whole pile of them turn up over the last month, so um, I've, I've got quite a few to play uh, to to paint up. But I've made a start, so I'm going to do Cursed Earth first because um, I've got some touring that can do that can handle that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so but it's it's a nice game, I'm, and I'm looking forward to. Uh, you know, playing it properly. I've played it sort of solo to get used to the mechanics. Um, yeah, it builds up its sort of RPG line. So yeah, it sort of takes a lot of boxes. And it's just dread, let's be honest. Mm. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Indeed. How about you, Rich? Anything that particularly t- floated your boat outside of your top five? I've just been playing a lot of board games, really, which is sort of unusual. Apart from that, I've just you know, been playtesting, so... I didn't include those in my top five games, a lot yeah. of Spartan stuff. And so between what time I've had, it's been the top five and playtesting and then just board games. So quick and easy ones like King of Tokyo and oh, yeah. 
small worlds and things like that. So, mm. I mean, my mate, I mean, started out just because of the uh, Will Wheaton you know, YouTube yeah. clips and things. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that is one thing that that I think has really impacted the gaming community for um, in 2012. I think, you know, getting that sort of exposure, even on something like YouTube. I mean, I know. You know, Will's a well-known geek and what have you, but certainly from the feedback, it seems that whenever they featured a game, all of a sudden uh, that particular game shot up in you know, in sales and what have you. So I think that's been particularly good, and it, and it, it certainly raised the profile of a couple of games that uh, that were kind of on my radar. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, the one, especially that I want to try and get hold of, is Elder Sign. That really looks. Um, it seems to tick, tick all the boxes for Arkham Horror without having to spend four hours playing Arkham Horror itself. So it seems like that. But uh, again, I mean, the small world thing just got our family playing. Oh no, yeah, no, yeah, because no, because yeah. they knew Will Wheaton through Big Bang. Oh right, yeah. Uh, rather than than Star Trek, and then uh, yeah, just thought it looked like a good fun game, and uh, so it's good. Yeah, yeah, and King of Tokyo, I must admit, has been one of my discoveries of uh, of last year. Yeah, uh, ex- excellent filler. Yeah, g- great, great fun. Yeah, I picked yeah. up the expansion yesterday, so it looks good. Oh right, well. okay. Yeah. I'll probably be talking about that in my next show because I mean, funny enough, my next show is going to be talking about board games for a change. As I don't tend to talk about board games much very often, but I thought this show we concentrate on miniatures games, and then I'll, yeah. I, uh, I'll, uh, I'll be doing a show talking about uh, about board games and stuff. Although I did swap all the things in King of Tokyo for miniatures, so that counts. <laughs> I would love to see your miniature of a psycho rabbit and a robot. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try and get pictures. <laughs> yes, psycho rabbit in big in, in big giant robot is definitely my favourite of the uh, <laughs> favourite of the monsters. Meeples and Meeples podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies. Two Fat Lardies are a UK company that produce rule sets for wargaming for multiple different periods. Whether you're looking for a division or army level game in the Napoleonic era or a skirmish game during the American Civil War, they will have something to whet your appetite. Their games include titles such as Sharp Practice, which is a Napoleonic skirmish game, Through the Mud and the Blood, gaming in World War One. Charlie Don't Surf, a company-level Vietnam game. And their most recent title, I Ain't Been Shot Mum, version 3, company-level World War II rules. They also have available the original Kriegspiel rules, produced originally in 1824 by von Reisbitz. So whether it's a piece of wargaming history, or the most up-to-date and current wargames rules on the market, you can find them both at Two Fat Lardies. Check them out at www. To fatlardies.co.uk and play the period, not the rules. Okay, we're going to our top five. Now, obviously, there's, between us, there's a little bit of crossover. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to go through in reverse order. And uh, if something's featured higher up, then we'll talk about it when it is featured higher up. Okay. So we'll start off with me. <laughs> Make- <laughs> it's always about you, Neil. It's always about you. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody think it was your show or something? Oh, yeah. Okay. It's still there. <laughs> Okay, so my number five is actually a game that was probably my favourite, or close to being my favourite last year, which is Excelis. Now, it's quite funny, is that in the fact that this seemed to be a game that we were playing right for the start of the year, right up until May, and then I haven't actually had a chance to play it since May. Unfortunately, it seems to have been a game which 
is dying. It's sad to say. Looking at the forums, there's nothing going on in the forums anymore. It seems that the guys who are developing it, other than a couple of uh, recent inputs on Facebook, appear to have um, disappeared doing other things. And considering that, I mean, I know they had a lot of financial problems and everything, but even so, they had potential big plans to do stuff at the start of the year. And I really think they missed a trick by not doing anything on Kickstarter or anything like that. But I think the bottom line was... They were just about to get a launch in Europe. Then their main financier backed out. And it's it's a real shame because I still really like it. I think it's got some really sound, uh, really sound mechanics and some really fun things behind it. I mean, I even managed to conv- uh, uh, I even managed to play a game with Mike earlier in the year. Especially with, I think, especially with the Demon Horde coming out and what have you, it changed the game. Uh, it enabled you to start playing a couple of things, especially like, like the Demon Army and stuff, which uh, I must have, I've got one of, I've got one of those. We were still, we're still only scratching the surface of it when, when I'm playing it with Dave and what have you. Uh, it just seems such a shame that the whole thing appears to have just died to death this year. You know? Yeah. You got me into it, I think, just as it was about to die on his ass. Um, yeah, sorry, mate. <laughs> that's all I have. I got some new figures, uh, which I painted up. I, I was quite excited by it. You know, I thought you know, being a geek, being somebody who does programming, I could see how it sort of hanged together. But like you say, without the people driving it, you know, the you know, the developers, it's going to go nowhere. So they either have to turn around and put it out for um, open source. You know, release the code out there and let some of the developers get in there and start playing with it or well I don't know what they can do I mean it, it, it's dying it really is and it, it's a shame but it's a game that needs it needs that that sort of computer input it needs people to drive it it needs you know the, the app to be available to run on multiple devices mm. that's been one of the biggest nails in the coffin the fact yeah. that when Apple upgraded to the new operating system well, the uh, one before last, it's iOS 5, isn't it? They haven't got it worked yes, before. That's it, yes. Yeah, so as soon as they went to iOS 5 and the app uh, and the app on the Mac that stopped working, they haven't got an Android app. Of course, by that time, they'd kind of lost their main funding anyway. So despite the fact that they'd rescued the whole thing, to a certain extent, although there, you know, there was a lot of big plans and everything, and lots of things that people wanted to do, there was a whole lot of talk at the beginning of the year about releasing a new hero. And it got the people who were still on the forum really excited about it, saying, "Okay, yeah, we can. Even if we just get a few things this year, then you know we can possibly keep things rolling." And obviously, one of the biggest issues with miniatures companies is new stuff, keeping things rolling, keeping things moving. Yeah, I mean, the game is still available. You know, if you look around now, all the minis and stuff are available dirt cheap because everybody's selling it off. All the servers are still up. You can still sign on. You can still get hold of stuff. You can still play the game. But it looks like it's going nowhere. So, unfortunately, it's one of these things of... Well, as I say now, I don't really see, to a certain extent, why people will get into it, other than getting a cheap source of figures. Yeah. So Yeah, it, exactly. It, yeah, so it's a real shame. I think I'll continue to play it. I've really enjoyed it. But... Uh, it's a real shame. It looks like it's it's going nowhere. Which it's the first time I kind of really bought it really bought into something big time and had it fall flat on its face. So I was uh, I was I was more than a little disappointed with it. But yeah, I mean it it, it has shown the sort of uh, fragility of the concept because um, a normal war game would just continue. I mean people are still playing WRG Six Edition now and it's been out for twenty odd years, probably more. Mm. A set of rules can always be played because you have the rule book there. But with Excelis, you need to have a computer to actually manage all of the, the combat and everything else. Mm. So you, you need a device. And, and you know, the, the market's changing. People aren't using laptops anymore. You know, the smartphones, tablets, that's, that's what people are playing. You know, that's, that's what people are using. So... If they had an app that worked on a smartphone, I'd be happy because I'm I'm not going to rebuild an old laptop of mine, which is currently running Linux, to run Windows just so I can play with Excelis, you know. Yeah. 
if, if I could play it on my smartphone, I'd be happy. But you can't. And th- that, I think, is going to be the um, death nail in the coffin for the um, Excelis. Agreed. You know, which is a shame, because like I say, the min- minches, are, you know, some of them are quite nice. Um, the angels, I think, are wonderful. Um, yeah, I so mean... The cavalry's a bit strange, but, you know, it's... But it's serviceable, it's nice, it's, you know, the £50 set gives you a hell of a lot of figures. That's it, and it's like, especially with places selling, I mean, the, the what was it, 54, 54 plastic figures, I think the starter set you can get for around about 25, 30 quid at the moment. And for that, it's, it, it's a steal. Um, I think, funny enough, you were saying, said the angels are superb. They were the first things to sell out. Oh, shock horror. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, despite its good points, I say reaction was always mixed to it. It, it, it does have it, its downside. As you say, the biggest thing being platform. They decided to go PC and Mac. Uh, uh, PC and Mac. So, yeah, yeah, so people play it on iPhones, which, considering the growth of the Android market, it, it just showed, I think, at the time, perhaps a slight short-sightedness in the company. And, unfortunately, they paid the price. But there we go. Enjoyed it, but I think, uh, as you say, figures going on to other things. Never mind. Right, OK, so that's my number five. So, Mike, your number five is a game that I still haven't played. Um, that's X-Wing. Yeah, it's Star Wars. It's nice figures. Plays well. It's fun. Can't, I can't say any more, really. I mean, the, the figures may be a little bit small. I mean, what do you think, Rich? Oh, I like them. <laughs> I, I, although I've got all my die-cast bigger ones, I still like the, uh, the little ones. I'm just waiting for the uh, the Falcon to come out. Yeah, I, I, I saw one of those down um, my local family local game install. They have one as a prize. And it, right. it looks great. It looks really good. Yeah, they had a production delay on the second wave haven't they but the, uh, yeah. uh, but the, for all the shops that are involved in distributing it they had this is it Kessel Run or something uh, yeah yeah with, a, yeah with the Falcon as a prize yeah it does look nice doesn't it it does yeah it, it, it's a great game you know it's, it is a good game it's a good game yeah it's not what you say about it and it's Star Wars so you can't go wrong yeah, yeah. that is very true and I must admit, despite all my protestations about it earlier in the year, it's still on my radar as something that's that is uh, perhaps worth getting. I mean, I know a lot of people just turn around and say, "Well, yeah, at the end of the day, it's Wings of War." It's not. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, be- it's better. It's much better. It's much deeper than Wings of War. Right. Okay. I stand corrected. Then. Next <laughs> <laughs> year, Star Wars role-playing game. I think there's one. Yeah. 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 F- uh, yeah. yeah Fancy flight. Really, uh, a Fancy flight uh, uh, release one this year. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they. Put, I mean, with that, and they'll because because they just released a living card game for Star Wars as well. They seem to be doing an awful lot for the Star Wars franchise at the moment. Yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah, X Wing is on my uh, is still on my radar when it comes down to you know, what I'm potentially getting this uh, in, in in this coming year. That might be that might be something I might end up cracking on. We'll see. <laughs> well, it's not painted that. for you. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to help. It's a, it's a game you don't have to play. Uh, to, sorry, it's a game you don't have to paint. <laughs> uh, hang on, so that's, uh, what, 20 minutes before the first mention of painting <laughs> came into it? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, okay, so, uh, right, if nothing, nothing more to add on the next wing, we'll move on to Rich's number five, which is Bolt Action. Hmm. Yeah, that was a game I've enjoyed playing this year, so... Picked it up and enjoyed it and waiting for the Japanese stuff to come out and then I'll be a happy little bunny. Yeah. Because yeah. I've got all my 15 bills, so, yeah. Well, it certainly seems to have been a game that has taken the hobby by storm in the last quarter. Rumours are that it's it's been one of the biggest sellers for Warlord. I must admit, even after our... <clears throat> the game that will live in infamy, I think. <laughs> yes, with my... With my marvellous Panther crew, having played Rich, I don't know, I I have reservations about it as far as uh, mechanics are concerned. Yeah, it does some nice stuff, but I kind of, uh, I took a step back and had a look at it and kind of went, well, hang on a second, at the end of the day, a lot of it seems to be rehashed 3rd edition 40k with a few bells and whistles and some command structure stuff from Warmaster. I don't know, whilst it certainly seems to be the thing that people want to do and people want to play... 
we've talked already about the um, uh, we, we, when we talked about bolt action, we talked yeah, about the issues it has with army building and the issues surrounding the point systems and the, f- the fact that it turns around and says, well, okay, this is what you should be doing, but doesn't enforce it, which basically means that it you know from a, from, from an organised play point of view, it potentially opens all the holes up to power gamers and what have you. And it just depends. Well, I mean, okay, maybe I'm not in a position to comment because I'm not a tournament gamer. But I think potentially from a, you know, if they're going down that sort of route, as far as games are concerned, I don't know. I think it just opened things up to the fact that I felt more than anything that it boiled down to being a a set of mechanics with a bolted on theme. You know, is that a bad thing though? If it gets people playing, you know, does it really matter? There's people who, who, who just want to play tournament games who really get off on that sort of competitive style, you know, just because myself and yourself don't do that, it just means a bad game. You know, if the mechanics are sound and you can play it using historical orders of battle, you probably look at it differently. So I, I just think you just got to say, Bick, it's a good game, it seems to be very popular. Rich likes it. It says some good things about it. You know, I got a lot of respect for Rich. Just because oh, it's not a game that um, I it, it doesn't push any buttons for me. But there's a lot of people who play it, and that's that's, that's never a bad thing. I just wouldn't play anybody that played stupidly. But then I don't go and get in a car with anybody that drives stupidly. So what's the difference? I see where you're coming from, but. Yeah. It's just horses for courses. It, yes, it, it, it does what it says on the can. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good game. It's a game. It's a good game. I mean, there's, you can't see it as being realistic, but I don't think you can see any game as being realistic. So, it's a good set of mechanics. It's it, yeah, it, it works. There's things that work equally as, as well, but I just enjoy playing that this year because it was something that a few people at the club picked up and, and wanted to play. So. Okay, so we'll go back to number four. Uh, well, my number four was covered a bit later on, so we'll cover that a bit later. So we'll move on to uh, Mike's number four, which is Maurice. Yes, Maurice. Yeah, this is a, a, a game that... Could be a rat. Again, I don't know where this came from. It's just I don't normally play many of um, Sam Mustafa's games. But I sort of heard about this, and people were saying about it, it, it's a card-based campaign sort of system for... Lace Wars and Imagination-y style stuff. Mm-hmm. I read the review of it and I thought, this looks interesting, so I bought it. Played it a couple of times on the club. But yeah, it's a clever game. It's, you know, it, it, it's similar to Duck's Britannitarium, yum, yum. In so much, it's a campaign system with almost like a, a game attached to it. But it's a nice game. It plays really well. It's interesting to play. I think I put, I put it into my top five. One, because I played it, and there wasn't many games I actually played this year, because I've been saga duty in. But it's a game I actually enjoyed, and I don't do Lace Wars at all. So, yeah, if if people haven't looked at it, go and have a look at a review. It's a good game. It's one of these games early in the year that, uh, well, sorry, when it came out, it certainly kind of split the wargaming community. It, it sort of had like a, a bit of a love-hate thing going on between it, didn't it? Yeah, it's a real Marmite game. Yeah. Um, I think he was quite brave doing it because the, the sort of lace wars from the Napoleonic crowd, they can be a little um, insular at times. And he comes up with this completely out of left wing game system. Yeah, and to be fair, it's not the sort of thing that Sam normally produces, is it? It's completely no. different. It's completely <laughs> yeah. different to anything he's done before. Yeah, but it's good. So uh, it's well worth playing. And in fact, you know, you can do it with six mil stuff. You know, the, the size of the bases are. Uh, Usually, sort of about thirty mil square bases, you know, four bases to a a regiment. Um, so I I did it with some six mil figures I had hanging around, a dozen or so units, and away you go. Great fun. Well, okay, so down to uh, Rich's number four. Uh, perhaps a controversial choice this one. Rich, forty k, forty k. Yeah, it's, I think we've we've, we've uh, mentioned it before. Um, my first foray into the 40k universe for a, for a very, very, very long time. Yeah, I, the new edition rules look good. Got them. They read well. Very, very solid set of rules. 
couldn't see anything wrong with them. Played really well. Got me into 40k because obviously a lot of the people at the club play. So yeah, and a lot of people have started playing again since sixth edition came out. Uh, our clubs tripled in size probably because people are just uh, been playing in the local shop. Have heard we're playing, so they've come down as well. So all in all, great success for us, and a good, it's a good game. It sort of uh, answered the, the few things I didn't like about previous editions from what I saw people playing. Yeah. And it, it's just excellently produced, well done. Look, I mean, again, you, you, back to that bolt action type of uh, discussion, you're going to get Pratt playing it. Um, and because it's played by loads more people than, that play anything else. And that, I mean, that, that it, that's what it boils down to. It's played by more people than play any other rule set, probably. Then you're going to get a fair amount of, of people that don't play it you know, for enjoyment, really. And like I've always said, I just don't bother playing them. People will line up their entire Imperial Guard army behind the barricades that a loophole in the rule lets you put down before you start the game. If they want to do that, let them do it. But I've enjoyed the games I've played with the people I enjoy playing with greatly. So that's why it's in my top five. Mm-hmm. So, so, Mike, this wasn't even in your in your honourable mentions, and yet you bought the limited edition. <laughs> I did, and it's still in the box, because I still haven't read for the rules. It's just... <laughs> Picked it up, sort of painting some of my older 40k stuff, thinking, yep, I'm going to finally do it this time. And just ran out of time, and then suddenly some new froth arrived, and it sort of sat there. But it, it's... I think with 40k, it's always a game that, once you've got a couple of arms, you can always go back to. But yeah. and as Rich said, says, and it's very right, is that you need to pick your opponents carefully, I think, with 40k. So you need to have you know people that you enjoy playing games with and if you got you know that sort of a, opponent it'll po- probably be a really good game if I'm playing some 14 year old sprog who knows the rules backwards because he's a rules lawyer and all this I probably wouldn't enjoy it but then I wouldn't pl- play that kind of play normally so you know it's sci-fi it's 40k it's got it's got its faults um, some of the new figures for the Dark Angel look particularly strange but I've got a Dark Angel army so I'm quite happy I will play it, but it didn't get into my Elmer's round because I haven't actually finished reading the rules. Oh. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Okay. It's a very thick book. It's like a thousand pages. <laughs> <laughs> it is big, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I must admit, again, you know, since we talked about it, it's kind of been kind of vaguely on my radar, but I, I don't know. I, as I say, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure whether I want to go back there. Yeah, so what they're doing with Dark Angels, just picking up a couple of bits of the fluff for the new Dark Angels Codex and what have you, and I'm kind of thinking, hmm, okay. They appear to be changing my favourite chapter into something that it never used to be, but there we go. That's what they do. Yeah. They, they, you know, they, they keep it fresh, they keep it new, new figures. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes on, because like Richard's saying, he, he's coming to sort of fairly new. And again, like anything, isn't it? I mean, you know, half the people say it's a breath of fresh air. Half the half the people turn around and say it's completely broken the game. You know. <laughs> yeah, but there are people at tournament players are saying that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, stuff them really. Because <laughs> that's one of the things, isn't it? I mean, because it was it's such a big tournament game, and yet this uh, it, it seems that this version is not amazingly tournament friendly. Yeah, I mean, but you say a big tournament game, there's big tournaments in 40k, but there's still awful lot more people that don't play in tournaments that play 40k than there are in tournaments. Yeah. Mm. So again, we're just talking that, that there's an extremely large number of people playing it full stop, so the tournament scene is big because there's obviously loads more players, but within the 40k players, the tournament scene's quite small. Yeah, I've, I think the tournament scene for 40k is actually gone down a bit I've noticed in, in my local uh, game store they don't do half as many 40k tournaments as, as they did a, you know, a, two years ago mm. now it seems to be all around sort of um, war machine and hordes so maybe that's taken over as the new sort of tournament style game I, I don't know I, I, I don't play that, that game at all so maybe you know bringing 40k back into the you know, in, it, you know, out of that arena into sort of standard rules might be the way it's going to go for a couple of years. It'd be interesting. I mean, I, I think the crux of the matter would be is when the new armies start coming out, the new codexes, 
whether they're all brand new killer codexes that mean that if you don't play anything other than that codex, that, that faction, you're going to lose, like they, like they have done in the past. So that'll be the interesting one to see, whether this Dark Angels codex when it comes out. If it's a completely killer armor that destroys everything, then, you know, they, they obviously I, haven't I think it'll be an interesting, interesting next couple of years with 28 mil sci-fi full stop, I think. Yeah, I think so. There's, there's lots of things afoot, isn't there? And as you say, if if GW fall back into the the old issue of Codex Creep, then it doesn't you know it doesn't matter what they do with the new edition of the rules. It just falls back into the same old treadmill, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Let's move on, and we'll move on to our number threes. So my number three is uh, I ain't been shotman which uh, I must admit has been my go-to game for company-level World War II this year. Really, it's the um, first year I've got back into company-level World War II for a while. The club I was with was very much into uh, Blitzkrieg Commander and was playing that for... Uh, it, that, that was their kind of standard company-level World War II game. Introduced them to Iron Bean Shotman when version 3 came out. And that has supplanted... Certainly, Blue Screen Commander within uh, within our club, and we've been playing the Operation Sea Lion campaign this year, and it's it's been tremendous fun. It's uh, it's 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 a solid set of rules. Probably concentrates more on infantry rather than tanks, and we can perhaps have that have that discussion in, in a second. I've certainly enjoyed it, and uh, it's it's just been nice to kind of get back into company level World War Two. So that's why it's on my list. Is to say, it's it's something I've been playing up playing a fair amount of this year. Solid set of rules. Yeah, I mean, production-wise, I think it was another step up for the Lardies. Um, I mean, I'm open for Mr. Clark to correct me, but I think Iron Being Shot One was the first time they went full colour with something. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a game I, I want to play, but I haven't played yet. I mean, we, we played a lot. Uh, of the, of the Initially, when it came out, I was heavily into it, because uh, Richard just lives up the road, really. Yes. Um, the war games journal we got we got quite heavily into it at one point yeah sort of drifted away because it began to annoy me a bit but it, it will be interesting to go back and, and try the, the the third I think I've just not got around to playing it mm. I think it's pretty solid I mean I think over the course of us uh, playing at club we certainly discovered how not how to play it and how not to play it shall we say uh, <laughs> uh yeah, I think the thing that that's got drug, uh, dragged us down in the end was the the whole card activation thing, which I know they've changed quite a bit, so it's not fair yeah. to sort of go on about it. But I mean, that's that's what did us in the end is the fact you you can be waiting round for your MG42 card until nearly the end, uh, which is was a bit crazy. I thought where that would be the thing that opened up the advance. You couldn't do the advance because you're waiting for the card to come out for. And if you had a lot on the table, that could be a long time. But I know they fixed that because you can activate things differently now, can't you? So yeah, yeah, yeah. You've you got a sure. choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think if if you've never played a Lardy's game before, and you're intrigued and you're interested by him, that's the game to to, to buy. Cause I think it's a really good introduction to their their ideas and their systems and the use of the blinds, and it explains how the blinds work, which some of the the other sets of rules that they've done, sort of, uh, they sort of assume that you know. So they mm. sort of. Well, even, over. With, so, even with the first thing been shot, more, it was a bit of a, a grey area, <laughs> the old blind thing. Mm. Yeah, but, uh, I think this this book um, it really explains it properly, and it, it shows you how their their ideas work. And I think once you've got that in your head, you can then go back and buy sort of Charlie and Surf or any of the other books that they've done in the past you know sharp practice or whatever you're interested in yeah and you'll get it you'll, you'll read through it and you, you, you'll just pick it up so yeah. it's a good primer i think for all of the large rules agreed and they've just released or oh, richard avery who's the guy who's done an awful lot of the scenario books and everything for i mean shopman what have you has just done a hard sci-fi version of this called uh, quadrant 13 which if you're not a world war ii fan but you're a sci-fi fan uh, I mean, I mean you know, similar comment. It basically just comes out, comes out sci-fi from uh, and largest games 
very similar perspective, except for the fact it just takes base mechanics from I've been shot them, puts it into a hard sci-fi environment. So, uh, so if you're not a World War Two fan, but you're a sci-fi fan, uh, it's essentially the same game, just with um, slightly different technology and uh, a few other, uh, you know, a few other bells and whistles for sci-fi. I think it's a so solid set of rules. As you say, a good place to start for a lot of lardy stuff. Yeah, certainly that last half of the year, it's it, it's it's suddenly come up, uh, come up against uh, some interesting competition in um, the the next set we're also going to talk about, which is which sorry, which is Mike's number three, which is Battle Group Kursk. Uh, this was on my honourable mentions um, because I haven't. Obviously, got... I am a fanboy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, listen, because I'm a fanboy. Hi, Mark. I didn't realise I came across that that um, gushing about. It. I really didn't. sorry. So, um, apologies for that. No, I, it's your mate. I, I, mean. yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like the ideas. I like the the rule system. I like the order system. I like the way the armies put together. I like the fact they did it for Kursk, which is seriously upset so many people, which mm-hmm. is never a bad thing. Beautifully produced. You know, it's. I can't say that much more. It's. I, I think it will be my game of choice for 15 Mobile World War Two. Yeah, it's. You know, I've played you know a couple of times. Get my head around it. Yeah, I, I think it's a fast flowing game, and it's you know a bit of paperwork and it's great. Um, um, however, I've, I've got to say, thank God for the you know, their Yahoo group because one of the guys on there has done all the sort of unit stats for each, each vehicle, all of, all the planes, all the artillery. All on nice little cards that you can just print out, laminate, and you've got it there then. Which addresses some of the problems you had, Neil, with the, with the weaponry. Yeah, and the fact that it's it's all kind of there, but it's all over the blooming place. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So if you're putting your army, so if you're putting your army together, it's trogging backwards and forwards through through an army list, trying to put everything together. And yeah. Oh right. Okay. I must admit, I've not been on the Yahoo group. The Yahoo group is very good. Right. It's well worth getting on to. There's a lot of good downloads on there. Which I think just enhance the game and make the game easier to play. My thing with it is, it's. I think I've gone to games that are smoother and simpler. It just overcomplicates things in in areas that seem a bit odd to me. When we reviewed it, we talked a little, a little bit about it. Almost kind of went a little bit old school in some of the things it does. I mean, it, at a time when you're not used to doing things like ammunition tracking or what have you, and oh, how many, how many armor piercing and how many high explosive shells I'm actually carrying in each tank and stuff like this you kind of think oh hang on a minute having I talk- really like it yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just love that concept having talked to Warwick I kind of understand why he did it that way because especially when talking about things like well how else do you start differentiating or, or you know some of the major differentiations between things like assault guns and battle tanks is it, you know is down to things like how much ammunition they carried the logistics behind, you know, how that works out over the course of an action and what have you. It, it, it has got a little bit of a retro feel to it from that side of things. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, I can't comment because, I, as I say, I didn't, re- I, um, I didn't really get to play uh, other than a couple of very cool kind of run-throughs of throwing dice in combat or what have you. I actually managed to get, get to play it too much in anger. But... As with uh, as with Mike, I certainly like a lot of the concepts behind it. Again, the way the the game, you know, the book is produced and everything is really nice. It's got some nice ideas in it. I like the order system. Don't know if I'm quite so hot on a couple of the other bits and pieces to do with the victory conditions and what have you. I can see what he's getting at, and and what, and I know some people will, will not like some of the randomness behind the way the game potentially ends, for example. Again, one of those horses for courses. I mean, there's an awful lot of company level World War Two rules out there now. It just gives you another feel. I mean, you can play Battleground World War Two, which is a very deep simulation style game. You can play Flames of War. You can play Blitzkrieg Commander, all using the same troops, all using the same figures, and each game will give you a different feel. So it depends on almost what your mood is. You know, what what you know, what sort of game do I want to play today? I I, I want to play a really deep engage. You know, a really deep game, I'll play Battleground World War Two. So you have Battlefront World War Two. I want something lighter, I'll play Bridge Commander. It's a good game, it's got nice ideas in it. Uh, but I, I sort of see where Richie's coming from. It maybe it does no, no, it's just things. a burst, like, it just I mean like, I mean I'm a great fan of 
I played a lot of Battleground World War Two. I played a lot of, or still play, if I can ever find anybody to play against, Final Combat, which is, <laughs> which is the ultimate. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The ultimate in tracking, but it's consistent across it. The, the thing about me is it wasn't, it, oh, I don't know, I've not played it enough or, or read it enough, probably. It seems overcomplicated in some areas and quite light in others. I don't know, I don't know. I didn't, I, it was just a personal thing. I, I, yeah. I'll come down and you can, we can play it. And, oh, okay then. Yeah. I, I can be, I mean, I'm not, un, I, you know, not against it. I just, the thing that, that struck me is it didn't seem particularly consistent. Yeah. I liked it. Uh, I see where you're coming from, and I think it's not without its faults. Having said that, again, it's something maybe I need to play a lot more of before I yeah. finally decide, you know, which way around. You know, but for certainly from where I am at the moment, considering my uh, ultimate stance was I am not getting back into Eastern Front World War Two, and I currently have a Russian army in 15 mil sat on my painting table. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, said my f- 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 from my point of view, I think on that one. Spray them green, give them a wash. They're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Too right. <laughs> At some point, you don't even have to paint them green. They just came out of the factory. Yes. <laughs> Put a bit of rust on them. They'll be all right. Yeah. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is very happy to be sponsored by Coat Arms Paints. Now, Coat Arms have been supporting miniatures painters with their products for well over 20 years in some way, shape or form. Their current range is 150 sets of acrylic paint, which are available both as individual colours, but also in paint sets depending on period. Things such as the Ancients paint set, the World War II German, World War II American... World War II Russian paint sets and they also include things like an ACW set and even a Horsetown set that's one way to purchase your paints and they also do triads now if you're a fan of the three colour system made famous by the likes of people like Kevin Dallimore you may like to purchase your paints with a dark shade a medium shade and a highlight and the triad system from Coat d'Arms allows you to do this They also have ranges of textured paints called Brushscape, which allow you to paint from textures onto bases as well as colour. And these are ideal especially for smaller scale models. And if you're a fan of the dip method of painting, then Coat d'Arms have their own product available called Super Shader. This is available in light brown, dark brown and black. Coat d'Arms paints have a whole range of products available to try. Check them out at www.blackhat.co.uk and be sure to tell them that we sent you. Right, okay, so uh, Rich's number three is in fact my number two, so we'll talk about <laughs> it at the same time, and that's Saga. So, Rich, take it away. Yeah, I think we've, uh, I think your listeners will have heard enough of, <laughs> of us three going on about Saga probably throughout the year. Mm. Very decent game, obviously, uh, just can't fold it, ticks the boxes, brilliant game to play. It's just, it was quite different, I think that was... Uh, the initial pull for me was that it, it, it was different, but not only was it different, it was good. So, yeah, it, it dragged me into an area where I'd never ever, well, not never ever, but sort of uh, didn't want to go really. So, well, that's happened with two of my choices this this time. I think um, I, I would never have dreamt at the start of the year that I would have wanted to get dragged into dark age stuff. So, but it shows how good it is, really. Again, it's a game. Yeah. yeah, it's very much a game. It's very much a game, but with a well bolted on set of hus- historical concepts behind it. I found it quite interesting because there's been a couple of chats about this going on on the uh, on the Facebook forum, and a couple of people have actually turned around and said, "Well, 
I'd have got into Saga if they hadn't moved so quickly with it. And it's like, well, what do you mean move so quickly with it? Well, the fact that we, all of a sudden we now have 14 factions in the space of 18 months. And it really is amazing how you get this this breadth of concept between gamers that you know some people were, some people have been clamoring for more armies and different armies and other people have kind of suddenly gone there's just too much to take in now despite the fact that I think the thing about that is that everything that's come out has been different it's not just been a so there's been different rules new rules it, it's not just been the first four factions jigged around a bit mm. uh, and I think I mean, I know Mike's heavily, you know, this well dragged into the world, and, and so am I, to sort of see it from the outside, I suppose. But talking to people, that's 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 what they've said. They've said, well, yeah, if it, I would have quite happily stuck with the first four factions uh, and played it all year, but now, because it's good and something else comes out, you want to get into that, but then you, you find you've got actually got to, they all play quite differently, you've got to relearn it in a way. Yeah, not not relearn the rules, but you, you you're not just all right. I'm really good with playing with this faction, so I'm going to choose one of the new factions out, out out of the new supplement, and I'll be as good at playing with that right away. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. And to me, that's good because I don't want to pay for something that you know it's just a a slightly different take on something that I've already paid for. Mm. But to other people, it, it, it's it's a bit too much sort of, oh, no, now I've got to... And then they get frustrated when they aren't as good with playing their new faction, which, again, I could never understand. But but just from people talking to me and, and people at the club, even, that, that's been what they've said about it moving too fast, I think. Having said that, now you've got... I know, we, as you say, we've talked an awful lot about it, but now we've got this kind of fairly solid 12 or 14 faction depending on how you look at it base for saga and you know people have got the opportunity to come around and play them all you've got a, a lovely breadth of opponent to play as well if you're just playing one army playing against the same army all the time okay there is a certain depth of tactic available but the fact that you know you've got a complete breadth of lots of different things to play against, lots of different armies to play against. As we'll come on to discussing highlights, I mean, you, you know, just just playing in in one day against three or four different other opponents, three or four different other armies, or even same armies with completely different tactics, certainly expanded my gaming experience immensely. Yeah. And so, I think the fact that they've come out and got all this stuff out there in the time that they have as well balanced as it is I think is uh, uh, I think is a major achievement and as I say the biggest thing I found with Saga is that yes it's got me into Dark Age which I never intended doing and it's a huge amount of fun yeah. And 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 you, do, you don't need you, you know you don't need a huge number of figures. Yeah, it's the same with say with Dux Vitani Arm. You get forty, fifty figures, sixty figures tops sort of thing, and you've got a complete army. And especially de- well, depending on, on the type of army you type of armies you collect, actually it isn't just one army, but you can actually you know pick and choose and pick up an extra couple of units, and you've got two or three armies to play. Especially with you. Know, the way the whole Dark Ages worked and the fact that a lot of the equipment was, and a lot of the way people dressed was very, very similar. I think there's an awful lot of crossover available. There's an awful lot of of breadth available. And I think the only thing missing from it, from my point of view, is a scenario system. Is a, uh, you know, campaign system or or, or something, uh, something of that ilk. Maybe some more scenarios and stuff. I mean, I know there's things in the pipeline for all this but that's the that's the one thing for me that's stopping it from being the perfect game, despite how much I've enjoyed it. As I say, it, it's my number two game of, uh, of 2012. I've played it almost as... Well, I think it's the the second most miniatures game that I've played next to XLS this year. And, and so I, I, I've... And you still haven't won. <laughs> He's won once. I've won, I've won once. I've won once. But, but we won't mention I was playing a girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very sexist <laughs> hi Sue <laughs> as you say I think we don't, to a certain extent we, yeah, we talked about Saga to Death a little bit this year for me it's it, it has been well with with one exception it's been the highlight game 
for me of the last uh, uh, you know of the last eighteen months or so. Really has been stand out, head and shoulders above almost everything else. Yeah, yeah, can't fault it. I can't say anything because I work on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Other than to say that your checks are in the post. <laughs> Right, okay, moving on to uh, Mike's number two, uh, which is another one game we talked a little bit about in, uh, over recent months, and that's Drop Zone Commander. Yeah, this would have been my number one, uh, but I haven't played as much as the, the game that is my number one. Despite what we said on the last podcast about the terrain, I still think it's a standout game. It's a lesson to all the other companies on how to release a game from nothing. The guy did a spectacularly good job on building up the, the, the froth uh, around the game. I think the figures are really nice. They are expensive, but I think they're really nice. It gave a good game, you know. I, the, the rule book is a bit all over the place, I, I will agree. Mm. But when I played it for the first time, it, it flowed really well and it gave a great game. And some nice ideas in there. So, yeah, I, like I say, it's, I, I think it's a standout game. It would have been number one, but I've only played it a few times. I've played it probably about half a dozen times. Which, from the number of games I played in 2012, is quite a good proportion. Yeah. So yeah, I, there's, there's not much more you can say about it. We've we, you know we, we discussed it in, in depth. So mm. Hawks announced that they've got some new stuff coming out in early part of 2013. They've done a lot of hard work looking at things like Rubber Karata and loads of FAQ updates and, and what have you. So. I'm not quite as sold on it as uh, as Mike is, but having said that, you know, again, it's one of those games that I've kind of looked at an awful lot, but I, but I actually haven't played that much, you know, rather than just rolling a few dice around, to see how the combat system works and stuff like that. So I can't really comment too much, other than to say that, as you say, other than the obvious faults behind things like, you know, said so the, the way the rules are organised and what have you, it seems perfectly solid game the rule book itself is a good read interesting you know nice different piece of fluff and what have you behind it a lot of work gone into it quite obviously and um, it'll be interesting to see how they expand it in the next 12 months it really will be to see where it goes and what they do next yeah one to keep an eye on I think yeah, yeah I've got my first game coming up I think a week or so oh right, okay yeah it'd be interesting to hear what you think about that one then Mitch it's got some nice ideas in it yeah, be interesting to see what you think. Okay, so moving on to well, what was my number four, but is Rich's number two, and uh, Mike's uh, opted out again because it's something else that he's worked on. <laughs> I'll just stay quiet in the background, <laughs> writing texts as I do. <laughs> I haven't worked that much on it. Really, you can join in. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's Muskets yeah. and Tomahawks. Now I assume from your other comment, Rich, that this is the this is the other period that you didn't think you'd be getting into in 2012. Well, ever really? Um, yeah, ever. <laughs> I just well, I never saw the potential of the period. I think, rather than than anything else, um, and it just dragged me into it, hook, line, and sink, really, and still there. I mean, it, it's again, it, it was mechanic. A set of rules that isn't sort of, uh, yeah, the, the combat mechanics or, or even the card system was different, but the, the, the actual mechanics is nothing out of the world. Um, it was just the general overall feel that, that dragged me into it. The, the whole cinematic sort of subplots and, uh, and characterization without getting bogged down into, into any, any form really of uh, you know record keeping or anything. He kept it simple, but he didn't feel like you were playing a simple game. If that makes sense, yep. um, it's got a, a lot of character, uh, a lot of feeling in the game, and and can be played very seriously. But normally, it, it's it's played out almost like a yeah a western or, or, or period drama. Almost, I love it. Well, I think we've talked about it quite a lot. Mm. I know, yeah, you know, some of the some of the mechanics rankle people, but then, yeah, you know, very rare will you find set rules that doesn't. And uh, I think this, as all the games I played this year, 
saga included, this Musket and Tomahawks has got the best feel to the game. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's certainly a game that has taken off massively at my club. Earlier in the year, I was thinking that Saga was going to be a, a real huge game at club, and a lot of people took against Saga for whatever reason. And it's been completely the opposite with this. Uh, I mean, I must admit, I was thinking it wouldn't simply because there's an awful lot of people that are opposed to, you know, the card activation mechanic and what have you. And I was waiting to see people turning around and going, "Oh, yeah, that's great, but it breaks the game and this that, and the other." And it hasn't happened. People have been, people seem to have embraced it completely and had lots of fun. And there's been huge amounts of friend, French Indian War stuff going on this year which has been a real surprise I think the way the card works means that it, it, well to me I think we, we're just rehashing what we said to, what yeah. we talked about it I think uh, I mean but in brief to me it, it just takes away everything that I didn't like about the card system but kept in the things that the randomness or or, or the feel that was nice but took mm-hmm. away the stuff I didn't that annoyed the Jesus out of me, and it, it just fits in with the whole feel of the game, giving it that sort of uh, cinematic type type feel. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it. I think it was designed to be a, a very sociable game. You know, yeah. it, it's a yeah. game. It 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 works best, I think, when you've got a gang of people playing it. When you because you know, it doesn't matter if you've got two on one side, three on the other, or whatever. You give somebody a couple of units, and it just works. It works on that sort of multiplayer game really, really well. And it's just a fun game. Mm. Yeah, I mean that game we had, Neil. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. As I said that that ranks as one of my gaming highlights of the year. That w- that yeah. was hugely enjoyable. And as as you say, it it told the story as you went through it, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Was that was that? Down ahead or partisan, I can't remember. That, mm, partisan, I think that was. And, and that did everything that, that's best about the game. That within the whole, you know, what was going on, there was a narrative going on, and uh, yeah, yeah, it was hugely enjoyable with all the subplots and all that sort of thing. Yeah, we, we had the same sort of thing when we, we played, well, I think it might have been one of Mike's first games where we ran through it at Griffin Beast. Yeah. Hours, yeah. I mean, people were playing that obviously got dragged into the game because we were just playing, uh, and everybody ended up enjoying it, and, and again got into that whole cinematic sort of approach, didn't it? Yes, yeah. excellent game. Uh, uh, very. I mean, I love the game anyway, but as a club game, it'd be hard to beat it. I think, mm-hmm. as in a social club game. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to our number ones. And now, since Rich and my number ones happen to be the same, uh, we'll let Mike talk first. <laughs> and Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what your number one is. <laughs> I can't even remember what your number one is. <laughs> well, Mike's number one is, is a game that I've caught a lot of flack for recently for not talking about yet as a, as a full review. Because oh, thank the war. <laughs> <laughs> close, close. Uh, because uh, it, it, I must admit, it is a game I really enjoy, uh, but it, I just not got around to actually doing a full review of it yet. And that's tomorrow's war. Yeah, this is the game that got me into fifteen mil sci-fi, which is something I said I, I would never ever do. I had no interest in it, and then I saw the game, and I I, I got into it through actually through you, yourself, Neil, through. The views on Force on Force. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Because you know, let's be honest, it's the same game as Force on Force. So you know, my, my top, my top of the top five is Tomorrow's War Stroke Force on Force. Right. But I love the sci-fi ideas. I, I like the idea that you can just fight your own fluff. And it's the first game I actually sat down with one of the guys from the club and we wrote our own bit of fluff and we wrote our own army lists. Mm. Um, you know, we came up with our own point system, the stuff. You know, we we just threw these ideas together. And I went and I had a look on the Curasan sites and discovered how wonderful Curasan figures are. I haven't bought a massive amount, I just bought enough to do a sort of platoon size game. Um, which is the, which is probably why I, I won't play Quadrant 13, because I don't want to go into the big company size game. Right. I like the fact that it's smaller. Yeah. I like the fact you can play with 20 figures 
um, and a couple of vehicles, and you get a really good game. And I also like the fact that it makes me think about how I play games, uh, especially when you're playing Force of Force, because I, I play in the uh, Ambush uh, Valley um, supplements. Yeah. Which me and Neil will disagree on, because I think it's a really good read, and, you know, it's a good primer for, for Vietnam. Getting sidetracked slightly. My argument with Ambush Valley is not about... Uh, the read it is I was disappointed with the Ambush Valley supplement that was produced by Osprey because of what it me- of what it left out from the previous uh, Ambush Valley supplement that came out when Am- you know when Ambush Alley did it. That oh, was, I, that I, I haven't my seen ex- that. Oh, right, because the. Right. Well, the one thing they left out from that, I'll, I'll, I'll have to show it to you. The, uh, the one, the one huge thing they left out is the campaign system. Yeah, that would have been really nice. Um, uh, no, yeah, the, the original is, I think, better. Okay. Force on Force wise, uh, although I bought Force on Force to play uh, moderns with, because of the way the game system actually works, I think it actually works better for Vietnam. Yeah, that's why I picked it. I, mean, I I played Tomorrow's World first. Yeah, um, we did uh, one of the one of the scenarios in in the book using my forty k figure. And I, as we were playing there, both me and my mate Ty just sort of looked at each other and went, "This is like Vietnam." And that that was it. I went and bought the I went and bought Ambush Valley, and we picked up some Battlefront fifteen mil Vietnam figures because they were going cheap on the shop. Mm. It gave me a chance to go buy a Huey because you, you, know, you got to have a Huey. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Bit of music, yeah. A bit of Wagner going <laughs> a bit on. Bit of going on, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But it was just a great game, you know. Eddie, the thing that got me was the fact that I was more concerned with keeping my uh, my casualties down low and getting my casualties off the table than I was actually, uh, uh, you know, actually doing the objective. Mm. And I've never had that before when I've been playing the game. It's always been a case of, you know, that's the objective. Go and charge at it. And, and, and throw units at it until they've gone. And this was different. This made me think about sort of urban style, jungle style combat really differently. And for that, I think it's just a fantastic game. I think Force on Force, full stop, is really, I've always liked it, you know that. And, mm. uh, well, Ambush from Ambush Alley days, so yeah, even when we were sort of writing all the World War II stuff, Force on Force, it was, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. This is something that's in the back of my mind with bolt, you know, with the whole bolt action thing as well. The fact that you know when Osprey went with force on force, yeah, they made a conscious decision that they were going, only going to use it for moderns, and then their World War Two system comes out with bolt action. As far, yeah, as far as Osprey's World War Two game set is concerned, and looking back and knowing that force on force. In, in its initial concepts, is built just as much for World War Two as it is for moderns. And knowing that Force on Force, well, okay, I know this is a matter of personal opinion, but I think Force on Force is so much better than Bolt Action. Well, no, I mean, I mean, I, I won't disagree because I, I mean, I've worked with them with the World War Two Force on Force. Mm. Um, I don't name plaster all over that. It, it is. It's. A, it's to me. It's. It's a far better get, yeah. You know, it's a far better game, but the amount of people that can't get their head round it, yeah, or it, don't yeah. like it, who will then quite happily sit down and play bolt action because of the almost simplicity of it. Yeah, the completely different, yeah, the, gaming yeah, they're, systems, aren't they? I mean, they're that, different, that's they're different courses, courses again. It's like, but I mean, force on force, it's Ambush Alley has always been a. A game where I've it, it that's the game that I've sat down and played with vets who've all said, "Gee, this feels like being there." Mm. Mm. And that is the only game, in fact, I've ever played with, with Afghan. <laughs> well, well, probably not the Middle East and Afghan vets who who have sat down and and gone. Yeah, I'm surprised how how this feels. Yeah, how, how close the, the feeling is. Not the mechanics, because nobody yeah. in the whole world can say the mechanics are, are realistic. Hmm. It, it's the feel. Uh, you know, the, do I go out? <laughs> what do I react against? How many times? You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's, 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 
it's stunning. It's a really stunning game. Mm. It makes you think about what you're doing. Yeah. And the guys that wrote it are brilliant. I love Sean. Yeah, they're, they're good guys. Yeah, and and to be honest, and they've been there. So <laughs> well, yes, and the other thing that had it, especially with Tomorrow's War as well, it it so much felt to me that that it was like the spiritual successor to Stargrunt, and Stargrunt was always my favourite kind of platoon company level wood sci-fi game. I I really like Stargrunt, and Tomorrow's War seems so much of a taking up the spiritual torture of what Star of of what Stargrunt was as far as especially a a, a platoon level. Uh, sci-fi game. I know it's you know it's, it's, it's all the nostalgia thing and what have you, but you know that's something that really that that really made Tomorrow's War appeal to me. So uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely something we need to do a show about uh, sometime in the near future. I think. Mm. Yeah, because I think the Afghan supplement is really good for force on force as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that leads us into uh, our last. Number one game for both myself and Rich, and uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you, you, you will not struggle to guess that. Funnily enough, that game's Dreadball. <laughs> it is. It is. And we've said an awful lot about Dreadball, both good and some bad stuff, over over the past couple of months or so. Okay, the issues, especially a lot of the distribution issues and stuff, have been fairly well documented around the web. I think people have you know, diff- differing opinions. Well, it's quite obvious people have differing opinions over the job that Mantic's done with the whole thing. All that aside, just taking a look, you know, taking a, you know, taking a step back and looking at the game. I know we you know, say we talked about it already, but for me, this is probably one of the biggest miniatures game releases uh, of both this year and probably next year as well, because obviously it's only just taking off with it being having hit the stores in December. So I think I think this is going to be one of the biggest games of next year. It has to be, I think. There's a, there's a lot planned as well mm. with it. Yeah, I mean it, it, it'll. I think it'll live uh, and, and live long and prosper. It, it will depend on the community, I think, and then the hot, the handing over a lot of that back into the community as well, Manticore. So yeah. uh, the whole thing is going to be run by what they call the Dreadball Executive uh, Committee for for coordinating events and things and, and competitions. And if they get... I mean, it's taken Blood Bowl 25, 30 years to get to the stage it is now, but if they can get anywhere near that uh, community feel of, of events and leagues... Then it's going to be massive. Mm. Mm. I mean, it, it, it's really interesting already. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, obviously, Rich. It, well, looking at uh, looking at what you what you've been doing. I mean, obviously, you you were playing a tournament yesterday, and it seems like you've been playing an awful lot of this. I must admit, I, I've only played about three or four games of this at the moment. Uh, it's a game. I mean, wouldn't you get? It's a bit like like Saga was it, in in the sense that you can pick it up and, and play it and, and finish it very quickly. Yeah. But it, why I've been playing it so much is that you don't even need as much prep as, <laughs> as, as Saga, you know, because you, you don't need anything out on the table apart from the, from the board and the figures. You know, you can play it anywhere at any point. And, I mean, I think yesterday we were finishing games in, in well under an hour, mm. uh, which means that you can, I think we got we about six rounds yesterday and, Oh wow. And and six games of anything normally normally fries your brains. Uh mm. and it it didn't, you know, it was we were cheering and, and jumping around as much in the last game as we were in the first game. Yeah. That's where normally I find with anything if you play five or six games during the day it's, it gets a bit jaded towards the end. Yes. <laughs> just because you you you're mentally so knackered. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, it, it's it's going to be a game that takes off, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah as, as I think, uh, as you probably said already, I think the biggest thing for me uh, about about Dreadball is is it's just so intuitive. The way the whole thing works, you know, comparing it, as, as I say, whether people like it or not, you're going to compare it to things like Blood Bowl. And when you compare just physically what you have to do within a Blood Bowl game to play a Blood Bowl game as opposed to what you have to do playing a Dread Bowl game 
and it's it's so much easier and yet it gives in some ways a much better feel to it as far as the game is concerned there's no getting away from the fact uh, as, as Richard you know I'm, I'm a huge NFL fan but you know Dreadball scratches that same itch and does it in, 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 in such a much more kind of intuitive and fun way for me yeah. And, and and that's and that's what really that, that's what really flow, uh, you know got me excited about the game. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I, I'm a massive NFL fan. I always have been. Always have been from when it first sort of. I remember listening to it on Forces Radio when I was a kid and getting fascinated by it. And then mm-hmm. and then yeah, you know, when Channel Four yeah you know, started doing it back in the in the day, really getting involved with it and starting teams up in. In Liverpool and stuff like this, you know, and we, we were playing, we were playing the first sort of gridiron games in, in England, and I've always wanted a, a game that simulated that, and you can't do it. You just, you, you cannot, you cannot do it. I mean, I've, there's a lot of good board games out there, Pay Dirt and, and, and Pro, whatever, that I used to play and still do sometimes. But I mean, I, I remember working with uh, two hour war games, and we were trying to do it. A gridiron game, and we had a, a very good set of mechanics for doing the scrimmage, and it it felt right, it worked really well, it was good fun to do, but then you realise you've just <laughs> yeah, you just spent three hours playing a quarter, yeah, because <laughs> of yeah. all the resetting, and, and the same mm. with uh, even I mean I started playing ball because it was NFL basically yes. in, in a fancy setting but then it, it just got bogged down into that continual resetting that continual sort of almost in the end you knew what was going to happen because if you do this somebody's going to do that it got to that sort of stage where it wasn't fun to play mm. uh, and this is just so simple in a, in, in a good way uh, intuitive is a better word I think and, yes. and, and, but it is very fast yeah, and you you can be you can be winning, and then ten minutes later you've just been beaten. You go, what? <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, because because yeah. one two your players have done stupid things. Mm. In some ways, you can always you can always tell it's a good game because some of the discussions on the forum if immediately we come out saying, okay, the game's broken because because the vehemen are far too powerful and the forge fathers aren't powerful enough and then Im- and, and then immediately it comes back saying uh, people can coming back with completely the opposite because their experience is something completely different and so actually you suddenly discover that it is something that not all, you know all the teams play differently it is quite obvious that if you've got a team that matches your playing style you can do well with them but it's one of these things that you have to learn the way the teams work and it isn't just a case of you can pick up a, you know the teams just don't you know it's not insert tab a into slot a with each team they don't all play the same you have to vary mm. things differently yeah and also it's the whole statistical debate what raised on and on, and people using the stats to show that Birmingham were brilliant and, and the four fathers were broken. And it was like, well, uh, stats are one thing. There's yeah. so much in the mm. game. Mm. Once We've you start using arguments. the cards, once you start using the cards, once you start to get three actions instead of two, once you start, even if you can double the, even if you can factor the, the sixes exploding into the stats, which we obviously can still doesn't show the whole story you know and and catching a vermin and pinning them down before you hit them is a completely different yeah it all really annoyed me on the forum and it's that's all gone very very quiet now because Mm. people have started playing they've started posting the results up and you can see that you know people are quite happily winning with forefathers the vermin are not going to be the over, you know, not going to be the team that runs away with everything. I, I, I played my first game with Forge Fathers just before Christmas, and again playing against orcs, who uh, who were, I, I was always having issues with, you know, when playing humans. Yeah. And basically doing to orcs what orcs had done to me as humans, and yeah. suddenly going, hang on a second, what is the issue here? Because I could, I, I mean, okay. We ended up playing out of draw. 
Yeah. I think we were saying that I, I, it, was, it was like you know, within a couple of days of each other, both of us experienced issues where we'd had an Orcs versus Forge Fathers game, which which went the entire game without a single score. Yeah. But yeah, you know, which some people would turn around and go, oh, uh, I mean, uh, somebody at club kind of went, oh, okay, so you played for however long and it's still nil nil. Well, that's just blood ball over all over again, isn't it? Uh, but actually, it was one of these things where. It's, it's one of those classic, you know, it's, it's it, uh, an exciting nil-nil draw sort of thing as opposed to a really dull yeah. affair. Uh, I think, I mean, a lot of the thing with the four charters is they aren't Blood Bowl draws. No. And you can't play them like that. You can't surround the ball and try them up the field until you, you get over the, the line because you're going to get hammered with them. Uh, you actually got to play them very, very differently than, well, they aren't dwarves, so you can't even think, oh, they're slow but very hard because... They're slow unless you're sprinting with them, and they're very hard unless somebody hits you from <laughs> from behind. From behind, yes. yeah. So yeah. yeah, and if they get knocked over, they're like turtles. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you can't play the same sort of game with it. But I mean, overall, I, the game has just been such a a breath of fresh air. I think in the same way that Saga was, in the same way that Muskets and Tomahawks was. Yeah. But in my, especially in my situation at home, it's. <laughs> You can get it out. You can put it on the table. You can play. You can go down to the club and you know, set it up in, in next to no time and have three games and get home and still only been out an hour and a half. You know, it's like oh, two hours. It's, 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 it's brilliant. And I think if they get the league system in place, then, then it, it, it'll, be, it'll take off. I mean, things have been now. Things are, are, are appearing that... You know, need I now, especially with the league and not having enough money and stuff like that. But then maybe that wasn't play tested as much as the core rules. Who knows? My my major fear with it once we started playing was, you know, the season two teams. Was it going to go down that the season two teams they made completely different, and were they going to be a bit like you know, Codex creep? Is it going to be that they're going to be so much better than the season one teams that you're going to end up having to buy them and play with them mm. to, to stay competitive or whatever? I mean, that was those fears have been alight, you know, have been set aside now. So I'm really excited. So because we actually, yeah, we went up and to their play test day for the uh, season two teams. So I like it. Mm. Yeah. So none that you know the, the, they play differently, but they're very matched against the season one teams oh right okay looking forward to that already then <laughs> yeah no, no they are good and there's some excellent I mean the, people know what they're going to be the teams but they, they do play they do play well they do play very well and, and different enough to be different but not different enough to be game breaking compared to the the season one stuff yeah I think what is going to change quite a lot is the is the campaign system in season two the league systems yeah the, the, getting a big rewrite I think that's the I mean you have to do a bit of fudging I think uh, at the moment with the once people start playing the leagues I think issues will, will come up mm-hmm. as it stands but that will be ironed out I mean uh, no no big deals but you just don't get enough money so yeah uh, but they know that I mean Jane knows that and, and that'll be addressed, I think. Right. Right. Okay, well, looking forward to that then. Okay, so there, that, that has been our top five of... Uh, I think, yeah, did Mike... Because Mike got one game, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've still um, got the second wars, actually, mate. Excellent. Yeah, I, I can say, I've, I got the rules. I just haven't had a chance to get into them and play them. But I, I can see it being a big game in 2013. Hmm. And it's quite strange, you describing describing the forum there... We had exactly the same conversation yeah. on, on the saga forums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, it mirrored it identically, I thought, yeah. and which annoyed me more. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's the same type of people, you know, the same type of inane arguments, really. It's like, just Do you think life. deja vu about the whole thing, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, yeah, get life. People were even going on to Jake's blog and, and going, oh, you know, before they'd actually played the game properly... They hadn't played with cards. They hadn't played. You know, looking at the stats, you can tell that, that Forge Wild is broken. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought he was very polite about it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, well, you know, the playtesters don't think that. People don't have an issue with it. You know, see how it goes sort of thing. 
Mm. Anyway, people. <laughs> <laughs> gamers, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I like playing games. I hate gamers. That's what it boils down to. <laughs> Okay, so that's our top five games of 2012. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Wargame Soldiers and Strategy magazine. A Wargame Soldiers and Strategy is published by Caravan Supply Publishing, the publishing house that is responsible for Ancient Warfare and Medieval Warfare magazines. Wargame Soldiers and Strategy is published every other month, and each issue normally surrounds a particular theme. Now that can be anything from US Airborne Operations on D-Day, Campaigning in the Dark Ages or the Colonial Wars, to name but a few. And every issue is packed full of ideas for scenarios, rules reviews, miniature reviews, painting guides, and even new rules and games. Add to that columns by people such as Rick Priestley and Richard Clark, plus all the latest hobby news and reviews, and you have an indispensable addition to your War Games library. For the news on the latest issues, and for subscriptions, check them out at www.wssmagazine.com. Before we go, uh, we thought we'd, be, we'd just uh, have a quick talk, talk, talk perhaps about some of, some of our gaming highlights from last year and maybe what we're looking forward to in the next 12 months. Do you want to kick off on that? Yeah, um, I, my gaming highlights have just been getting into the two things that I never thought I'd get into too heavily, getting into Dreadball full stop and, and that being exciting. Mm. Um, and, you know, yeah, highlight-wise... Meeting up with Mike quite a lot. Oh, been a highlight. And obviously, being on this show. <laughs> oh, you corporate tart. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I, I, mean, I just like the way I can whinge at people and they can't whinge back at me because they have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just me, so they have to keep listening in case you two come up with something actually worthwhile saying, but all the time they've got to listen to me whinging. I mean, I mean for me, I must admit, a couple of things. I mean, obviously... A couple of games we've had with you this year. I mean, especially the muskets and the, the muskets and tomahawks one. That was a, a real highlight. Also, the um, the saga day we had the one from War Gamers. Yeah. yeah. Dan and Evesham or Evesham Way was was excellent. Uh, had a really good time there. The Society of Ancients Battle Day. Again, another huge uh, uh, another hugely enjoyable day. Really getting to saga, getting to dreadball. Biggest highlights been t- getting a chance to meet up with people, play some really good games. So, uh, yeah, that's, again, been something that's, uh, that's really been good for me this year. How about you, Mike? <clears throat> well, for me, I think, mean, I think one of the big highlights was at, um, Warfare, um, when Rich came over, and see, before Dreadball came out, and he said, do you want a game? Cause I've, cause I've got it in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, went in hidden in the corner of the, of the hall, and he sat at the table, and he showed me the rules, and you can see people walking past going, is that Dreadball? It's, <laughs> and uh, that was just, you know, it was it was about twenty minutes, and he showed me the rules, and it was just it was a nice relax for me because I was being busy all all weekend, and I was just nice downtime with a mate playing a game, and thinking, oh god, I'm actually going to enjoy this when I really didn't want to. <laughs> um, so that was that's that the was, thing. I, I, it is a game. God, going back, sorry, Mike. It yeah. is something that people they enjoy and don't really want to. I yeah. mean, we've had it, it's it's been one of the few times at the club where we've had people cheering. Who aren't even playing? Yeah, they've been standing and watching and jeering or cheering. <laughs> so that, that was my big highlight. I think mean, the other one was Alex, Alex Michelle, who's the writer of Muscle Tom Oaks and Saga, came over. Oh, this is mine too. Yeah, <laughs> you kind of had this one as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, he came over to Grim Beast. Yeah, he came over to Grim Beast, and we had like um, 
a, a planned out meeting and, and a curry weekend and he bought his new game um, Juggler which is a gladiator game which is a game another game I've I have no interest in and played it and Rich uh, wiped the floor with me because he picked up the rules in about 30 seconds and I was still struggling going <laughs> can this guy move over here oh he's dead um, and yeah, it's going to be a good game it's I think Juggler is going to be another another Alex Michelle classic game and playing that first was, was wonderful other than that it's yeah you know being on here I think it's been a highlight it's um, and, and getting more into sort of the rules development side which I've never done before I've always just been a gamer I've always just played the, the damn things but Alex has just turned around and said you know I, I've given him some ideas for for um, supplements to Muscular Tomahawks and Targo and he went go on then go and write them which was a terrifying but thrilling experience so there's one of the games I'm working on in the background and I played it with some of my mates and it worked it was a really weird experience to come up with some ideas that I, I had and watching people play them. So, yeah, that was nice. Good good highlight. And, of course, being on here, which has been a wonderful time. <laughs> That's twice you mentioned it. You called me a Tom. Yeah. <laughs> you're great, Neil, and you're great, Mitch. Aren't we all great? Oh, dear. <laughs> can't, you, can't you tell it's the end of the year, eh? Yeah. <laughs> We've gone all gushy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've I've and, and and finally, um, is there anything you're looking forward to next year? Ooh, mm, yeah. Ooh. Uh, Dread Ball season two. Yeah. And Rick Priestley's new venture. Oh yeah, with uh, with not John. Dr- no, um, uh, yeah, um, Kawaki, What's his name? Keep going. Keep going. Go on. Um. Uh, um, yeah. Supremo from Warlord. Um, um, Stallard. Stallard. Oh, you, oh, you could have kept Stallard. it going for ages. Then. <laughs> you know, I could have been going for ages, and, and, and don't worry, I will edit it always out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah John Stallard. That's the guy. <laughs> yeah, the sure. Neil. The, no, I won't say. It. I the Neil Alzheimer's show. <laughs> Have it's I told you about a my short term memory problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you what? Have I told you about my short term memory problem? Did you what? Have I told you about my short term memory problem? Did you what? <laughs> Goldfish, danger, <Sorry>. Goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> this is deteriorating. Let's get this over quick. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, anyway, yes. So, looking forward to. That's what I'm looking forward to. Because jumping on the bandwagon already and the kickstart starts tomorrow and. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. I must admit, I, I've had a look at various bits and pieces, and I'm kind of, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I must admit, I'm, I'm very much sitting on the fence as far as that one is concerned at this point in time. I know it sounds t- tremendously boring of me for a change, but I'm actually kind of going. Well, I'm actually quite content with the sci-fi stuff I'm, uh, I'm already into, and although some of the fluff looks interesting, it's kind of, mm, yeah, okay, I'll wait and see. Yeah, well, I think everybody's got to wait and see, haven't they? But um, yeah. I don't know. It'll be just be interesting to uh, to watch. I mean, I, I, I like Rick's stuff. I've known him for for a long time. Yeah, it's, I'm just uh, excited about it. Mm. He said in the most unexciting voice I've ever used. <laughs> Quite excited about it. How about you, Mike? Oh, a couple of things. Dystopian Legions. I want to get into in 2013. Um, As you should. As I said, the figures are fantastic. I'm just painting my second squad now, and I've got some tank heads to do. I'm interested in Armor Clash as well, which is another Spartan game. As a ex big um, epic player, yeah. Like I've said on being before, I like the Dystopian Wars figures. I'm not, I haven't got on well with the, with the game system, but if they're coming out with a, a bigger scale game using those figures. And I ha- I have seen one of the very very early drafts of it. I think that could be a nice little game to get into. Mm. So, Planet that Planet me. Good. yeah, I'm not sure on that one. I'll have to have a I'll have to have a look at it. Other than that, um, yeah, I help with that one. So, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to have a look at it. Yeah. The other big one for me is um, the return of a very long old friend, which is Slaughter Lou. Oh, right, is, yes. Uh, which is the big brother of Flintlock, which is one of my early games. And I, I love Flintlock. 
they did a redux of it a couple of years back, and it's a great game. But Slaughterloo, the, the whole mass battle, fantasy, Napoleonic, to me, it's just genius. So they're, they're re- redoing the rules. You know, it means I might actually get around to finishing some of the Rat Army that I, my wife bought me for my 40th birthday six years ago, which I still haven't done. But yeah, that one, I think, I, I just love the whole concept of, of, of Slaughterloo. I love the yeah. fact that it really upsets Napoleonic players when they walk <laughs> over and see these ranks and ranks of be- beautifully painted, historically accurate figures, and then work out their elves. <laughs> and the looks on their faces is just worth it. But it's a good game. I mean, the second edition yeah. was a really good game, so third edition, hopefully, will go along and make it a bit more streamlined. For and myself, I I'm looking forward to the Normandy supplement for Battle Group, Dread Ball Season 2. There's the new ex- expansion for Dux Vitani Arum. And then the other thing I'm, I'm still I'm, I'm quite interested in is this new uh, set of skirmish samurai rules that are coming out from Osprey. They look quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds of derision in the background. <laughs> Just play Bushy No You Me. <laughs> yes, precisely. Indeed. I haven't really got any like, you know, big new games I want to get into. I mean, uh, the aim was to do this in 2012, and I never quite managed it. I was looking at, okay, it's consolidation. It's like, let's look at what I've got. Let's try and make sure I can paint an awful lot of what I've got and decide what I'm keeping and what I'm getting rid of and all this sort of thing. What about so, The Hobbit? Hmm? The Hobbit. We've got to play The Hobbit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing that in card games. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm doing that with Fantasy Flight. I'm not. Uh, uh, yeah, I must admit, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing that in miniatures. <laughs> I know, lightweight. I know. But yeah, there you go. No, uh, uh, say so I'm doing that with the Lord of the Rings card game and stuff. But uh, and that's blooming difficult. I can tell you. Uh, uh, let me tell you. I played that over Christmas and got my ass kicked. <laughs> me, me and what game don't you get your ass kicked in here? <laughs> yeah. Neil, well, not, it, not being horrible, are you but... sure the war game is, is a good hobby for you? Everything's going to talk about fly fishing. Yes, I'm, I, I was going to say, <laughs> remind me again why I war game when I, do, when, yeah, you know, when I lose 95% of the games that I play. <laughs> is it just a case that I've chosen a hobby I'm not really very good at? <laughs> I mean, the rest of us are good. It's proof of a parallel universe. <laughs> In that universe, you're playing the same game and winning, you see. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that it, it, the two the two lines never sort of match up. In that yes, in that case, then I want to invent our own version of fringe and crossover. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! I think at that point, I think we need to uh, look at drawing this to a close and and going on and celebrating New Year. <laughs> so, three minutes to go, chaps. Three minutes to go. <laughs> Let's <just> pretend. <laughs> ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> Roll of praise. Look how delicate we are. If we were really that sad to be doing this, <laughs> yeah. this apart. <laughs> apart from the fact we'd probably all three of us be divorced. Uh, well, well, there's that, I suppose. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, again, the other thing is, you know, it's been great having you both on the show this year. Uh, it's yeah, it 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 it's meant yeah, you know, it's been great having conversations with you and and what have you, and it's meant that the I have ratings have gone up. We know, we know. Yeah. Well, other than the fact it, it's and, and it's not been me sat here talking to myself, you know. So, are you looking forward to uh, our spin-off series? I mean, which going to do <laughs> when we go off and do our own podcast and talk about you? <laughs> uh, I, I, su- I suppose it's inevitable. We wouldn't do that. We didn't have to, have to record them. <laughs> oh, oh, and and I did actually just want to say thank you to Rich for uh, pointing me in, in the direction of the Galactic Football League novels. All uh, right, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm enjoying them at the moment. It was the first thing I bought for my new Kindle. They are good, aren't they? They, they are good. good. Uh, yeah, uh, as, uh, I mean, yeah, we've just been talking about Dreadball, and other than the fact that it's a, it's it's Ameri- American football, it could just as easily be Dreadball. It's uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, uh, uh, I'm not quite so sure about all the um, uh, all the kind of background story in um, in Gangland, this, that, and the other, uh, uh, and what have you. But uh, considering the fact that they're only a couple of quid on Kindle, for yeah, they're, they're, it's as long as you get them in the right order. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, but I mean, it, yeah, it is a it is a dreadball universe, but not dreadball. So yes, yeah. but yeah, for the yeah for the sake of two or three quid, they are well worth a look. 
So that's the Galactic Football League, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you enjoy NFL or, or dribble, well worth the read. So thanks for that, Rich. Uh, oh, pleasure. <laughs> so as I say, so st- thanks to both of you for being on the show. Thank you uh, f- for both for your uh, for accompanying me through po- through 2012. And also thank you to everybody for listening to the show for the last year. Uh, I hope you've had a good year of gaming. I hope you've picked up on. Uh, I hope you've picked up on some good games that uh, that we've talked about in this year. And all that's left to do is to wish you a, a very happy 2013. I hope that. It turns out to be another good year of gaming for everybody. Indeedy. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. So, thanks to everyone. Happy New Year, and we'll speak to you soon. Happy New Year. I'm, 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 I'm sitting here trying to pop. From, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know the... <laughs> the oh, oh, there it is. Hey! <laughs> Party <New> <laughs> It's going mad. Oh, dear. I hope nobody needed that sheet of uh... <coughs> anyway bubble wrap. The sound effects on this podcast are wonderful, aren't they? It is it's great. I can do it again. Look, I can do it again. Oh, hold it. Oh no, I've popped Ooh. all the corks. Ooh. It's five o'clock. No expense bed. <clears throat> can I go to the pub now? <laughs> oh, you mean you're not there? No. <laughs> oh, that got drat. That's where I went wrong. <laughs> right. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care. Um, okay. Take care. We'll okay. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Well, that was episode one hundred, and I just want to say a huge thank you to both Rich and Mike for their contributions to the show. I hope you've enjoyed hang- having them along as co-presenters during the course of the year. Just before I go, I just wanted to say uh, a few more thank yous. First off, uh, I wanted to thank all the show sponsors. Uh, They've really helped the show during 2012. And I just want to say a huge thank you to uh, Two Fat Lardies, to Coat Arms Paints, to Wargame Soldiers and Strategy Magazine, and finally to Caliber Books. Uh, I've really appreciated the help and support I've had from them throughout the year. And whilst I appreciate some people don't like having adverts in the show, uh, at the same time, uh, the support of these people have really helped me to to, to do some things which uh, I, I, I couldn't do before. So, so a huge thank you to all the show sponsors. And talking of sponsorship, I wanted to say uh, another big thank you to everybody who sent in donations for the show throughout the year. That has been massively appreciated. Thank you to everyone for their generosity. I uh, also want to say uh, a big thank you to everybody who I've interviewed this year uh, and also those companies that have provided review copies of raw sets and models. Special mention goes to people like Wool Games, uh, Plastic Soldier Company, uh, Richard Two Fat Lardies, the guys at Fireforge, Rob Broom at Scarab Miniatures, uh, Osprey Publishing, Western Productions, uh, and uh, several other people as well. As you can probably appreciate, uh, I've had... Uh, most have sent in to have a look and review that I managed to get through this year but as I say uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody involved uh, in helping to make this show possible and finally of course I want to thank you the listener I wouldn't be doing this if no one listened to the show and the fact that individual shows uh, are listened to by well over a thousand people in the space of a month it's something that I never thought would happen when I first started the show. I really want to thank everybody for downloading the show, uh, for uh, your messages of appreciation and support, for people's constructive criticism. You know, this really is a show that, I say, started originally as a hobby, has become something a little bit more than that. It's evolved into something slightly different from from what it started. Uh, hopefully what it's become is a show that more and more people want to listen to so as I say uh, 
a huge thank you to you all for listening. So, take care. Happy gaming. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you want to know more about Meeples and Miniatures, there are several things you can do. First of all, you can visit the website at www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. If you want to contact the show at all, you can email me at neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. You can follow the show on Twitter. Simply look for M&M Podcast or click the follow us on Twitter button from the website. We also have a group on Facebook. That's the Meeples and Miniatures Podcast Fan Club. Again, follow the link from the website. And finally, if you want to help to support the show, you can always donate to the podcast by clicking the PayPal button on the donate page, again, found on the website. Once again, thank you for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.